Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest vodcast. And this one is going to be on small bowel obstruction, a topic that all of us deal with in body imaging almost on a daily basis. When you think about it, in the ER, abdominal pain is the most common cause for an ER visit. Overall, and the second most common in patients over age 15, with chest pain being the most common in that age group, it accounts for over 8 million of the ER visits every year. When this article from Jim Thrall was published from Mass General, where they were looking at the accuracy of CT and whether CT was used appropriately in the ER setting, you can see the two most common diagnoses were renal colic and intestinal obstruction. CT, of course, was outstanding in this uh, study, altered the lead diagnosis in about half the patients and increased uh, accuracy and certainty uh, up to 90%. So again, very, very important. And again, you can see, particularly with bowel obstruction, we always think about surgery versus no surgery. And a quarter of the patients who were going to go to surgery before CT ended up being discharged. So it's a very, very important thing. And again, of course, uh, clinical evaluation is, is important. And we don't want to be scanning everybody. But in the ER setting, uh, of which small bowel obstruction is going to be one of the key diagnoses or suspected diagnoses, CT proves to have a major role. Now, in terms of our protocols, patients with small bowel obstruction or suspected small bowel obstruction actually are kind of very easy in the sense that they have a lot of fluid in the bowel, particularly if they're obstructed. And so when you're looking for transition points, uh, nature is giving you a transition point. We typically, because we always worry in older patients about ischemia, are, are always going to use IV contrast with bowel obstruction. And since the patient... Um, is going to be evaluated to look at the bowel, look at bowel enhancement, look at vessels. Water is an ideal contrast agent. You can use Omnipaque, uh, which is our second choice, a positive contrast agent, or Volumen, which we rarely use. But uh, positive contrast agents can be used, uh, but we do prefer to use water in that scenario. IV contrast is always going to be critical for us. Uh, without IV contrast, it's very hard to tell anything about perfusion, uh, you can see bowel obstruction, and often you can follow its transition point, but it's hard to really get the information you need on a study without IV contrast material. I mentioned about water versus positive contrast, and I've made the point before. If you're looking for perforation, you use positive contrast. We use oral omni. If you can't get IV contrast, we use positive contrast. We use oral omni. So in this case, you can see the patient has a perforation from the duodenum. You see the pneumoperitoneum very nicely. Very, very easy example of where the positive contrast works oh so nicely. And of course, you look at a case like this of a patient with Crohn's disease, and you do see the positive contrast, the mild dilatation of bowel. You do see the diffuse thickening of the, of the colon. You do see the stranding in the prominent vascularity. But one would have to admit you see it a lot better on this study when you use water as a contrast agent, and now you see the vasorecta, the comb sign, the dilatation of the bowel, the transition points. Using a combination of volume rendering and MIP, you get superb accuracy and significantly more information. I'll just mention about volumen. Uh, it was very, very popular. It's becoming less and less popular. The results initially were great. Now they're okay. It's expensive. Patient tolerance is variable. Enough said. So, but in our scenario, I would say 70% is water, 30% is oral omnipaque. Now, the topic of looking at bowel, we usually use the term CT enterography, and there have been many articles speaking about that and really focusing on a dedicated small bowel study. And we try to explain this to our clinicians, and uh, particularly the GI guys know very much about this because it's spoken about and written about it in the GI literature. And so they're, they're very knowledgeable, and it's a very common study that we will perform. In terms of the patient, depending on the clinical scenario, we often will do dual phase imaging, arterial and venous. We do not do non-contrast and essentially never do delayed phase imaging. We use thin section CT, 0.75 millimeter thick sections every 0.5. We found that to be ideal when you do reconstruction. And arterial phase and venous phase in this scenario typically is going to be at about 30 seconds and 60 to 70 seconds post initiation of injection. And of course, uh, the better your scanner, the, uh, the better the parameters indeed can be. But that 0.75 by 0.5 work well. We do make the point and have discussed this in prior lectures that axial imaging is in no way enough. 
that routine, the baseline we do is axial, coronal, sagittal, and 3D imaging. And I like to show this case, and I'll show it to you again, making the point that yes, you see the Crohn's and thick and small bowel here with mucosal enhancement, but yes, you see it a whole lot better on the coronal, and you appreciate the extent better, but you see it much better when you look at the MIP imaging and see the vascularity, the comb sign, and see it even better on the volume rendering where you see the thickening of the bowel, which you can't appreciate on MIP imaging, and also very nicely see the vessels. So it really is a combination of techniques that really optimize visualization. So now let's specifically talk about small bowel obstruction. When you think about SBO, you think about four things, adhesions, IBD, small bowel tumors, and hernias. There are other causes of small bowel obstruction, but those are probably the big four. And when you look at numbers, adhesions is the big bear in the room, 75%. Hernias, 10%, and tumors, 5%. Go back 100 years, hernias was number one. So as a radiologist, and in fact, if you're a surgeon or an internist, what do you need to ask and what do you need to answer? Does a patient have a small bowel obstruction? or the patient's symptoms related to another condition, appendicitis, pancreatitis, cholecystitis, aortic dissection. If the patient does have a bowel obstruction, is it partial or complete? Can you simply uh, monitor the patient, or do you need to admit the patient? Do you need to take the patient to surgery, or can they be treated medically? Those are the decisions you need to answer. Now, there are ways of classifying bowel obstruction as simple versus complicated, simple being described more as intermittent or partial obstruction, though occasionally it can result in uh, high-grade obstruction. Complicated are the ones that go to surgery that have the high morbidity and high mortality. Quickly go to surgery, closed loop or incarcerated obstruction within a hernia or strangulation of bowel. Remember that in the patient who needs surgery, if surgery is delayed more than 24 hours, mortality is up to 25%, while with early surgery, it may be as low as 1%. Things like untreated strangulation are 100% fatal. So it's really a life-saving diagnosis. In terms of looking at this CT, what do we look at? Wall thickening over three millimeters, abnormal wall enhancement, which could be increased or decreased. We talk about white bowel and dark bowel. We look at positioning of the bowel. Is it in a hernia? Is there malrotation? Is something going on in terms of a, the, uh, the lay of the land? And what about the mesenteric fat? Inflamed mesenteric fat, collections in mesenteric fat are all things that can be suggestive to us of a process going on. When we look at individual bowel loops, we talk about a loop over 2.5 centimeters. We'll talk about a feces sign, which means there are air bubbles and what looks like intestinal content prior or proximal to the site of obstruction. It's a really, really good sign. It was originally described with cystic fibrosis in patients with malabsorption, but really it's a very nice sign for bowel obstruction. I'll show you in a couple examples. We look at small bowel wall thickening, and then a very important thing is really this idea about transition. So if I look at this case, you see dilated small bowel very clearly seen, and then the lowest loop has what looks like stool within it. And when you follow it, you can see a transition as you track it up toward the right upper quadrant. Here it is again with coronal and with coronal 3D. And what you can see very nicely is that transition point. There's like a band present and there's a very sharp transition. The feces sign leads you right up to the transition point, which is very nicely seen. Now you can see in these examples, the coronals work very nicely because axial imaging does lots of partial averaging of the bowel loops. Here you can follow the loops for a long segment and you can see very nicely the patient's uh, transition point, which was due to a band. Bands are often very small. You don't necessarily see the band per se, but you can really ascertain its presence by the appearance. Look at this case. Well, the first thing you look at is there's dilated bowel on the left side of the abdomen, but there's also ascites. That's a bad sign. And what you quickly notice is that that bowel, besides being dilated and the ascites is engorged, it has decreased enhancement. That patient has decreased flow to bowel. And you notice the bowel all seems to be in one place, and that appearance is really a home run classic and mini diagnosis of an internal hernia. And when you look at it on the coronal view, you can see how it's twisted, 
All the bowel is displaced upward. You can see the more distal bowel is normal in caliber. Ascites present. Ascites is a bad sign to me because if I see thickened bowel and I'm worried about obstruction, when I start seeing ascites, I start thinking about ischemia. And just a beautiful example in this case of an internal hernia. And this patient went directly to surgery. The about 40 cm of bowel was finally resected. Again, a very nice example showing you the marked enhancement of the the marked enhancement of contrast, but the lack of enhancement of the bowel. The bowel folds are edematous and thickened, but you can very nicely see the uh, the, the appearance of that bowel loop. Uh, so very, very nicely seen. Another example, we'll go from left to right. Ascites, dilated bowel, but look at those bowel loops in the patient's um, right upper quadrant, and you can very nicely see the loops there, and you try to follow them, but look how much easier it is in the coronal view. Now you really see what looks like a bunch of bowel loops trapped in the right upper quadrant. This is your classic internal hernia. You can see the transition point. I'm just showing you some very nice 3D images, which can look through this well. You can see the vessels are engorged. The bowel enhancement is somewhat decreased. That's an internal hernia with closed loop obstruction. And this idea about closed loop obstruction, which is so important, it can be caused by adhesive bands or internal or external hernia. Closed loop obstruction can lead to a volvulus, which leads to impairment of venous outflow followed by arterial ischemia and infarction. The CT findings, the C or U-shaped distended loops with the mesenteric vessels converging toward the site of obstruction. And again, the site of obstruction is best seen on coronal views for the most part. Axials should suggest the process, but it's much easier if you're uncertain or even if you're certain to see it on the coronal views. An example here, you see a loops of bowel, good injection, but those small bowel loops are really not enhancing well. Also, you have a bunch of small bowel loops in the lesser sac. That's not where they belong. Just to show it to you, look at that coronal view. Just beautiful, the way all the vessels are edematous and engorged. And here it is in 3D. Again, this is a classic diagnosis, and I'm showing you this because it's so important that you make the diagnosis definitively, which will save the patient's life. Again, I find this sometimes one of the most challenging diagnoses. Perhaps this is a more obvious case, but this patient clinically wasn't that ill, and people questioned perhaps whether this was the right diagnosis, but it's very classic. In terms of obstruction, I mentioned hernias being number one. Here's another example. This is more of an external hernia. You see dilated bowel, you see obstruction, you know something's going on. And when you track downward, you see that the bowel goes through a right inguinal hernia into a hernia sac. And when you look at the coronals in 3D, you see there's some ascites within that sac. And this patient has an internal hernia and the bowel is becoming ischemic. So when I start seeing ascites, uh, that's what I really get of concern. Now, other things in terms of obstruction, Crohn's disease is a very common process we see, and one of the typical presentations is an obstruction. You can get abscess, you can get fistula, but obstruction is one of the most common. And things we see with Crohn's, it's a classic disease from mucosal hyperenhancement, wall thickening, mural stratification, seeing multiple bowel layers, prominent vasorecta, the so-called comb sign, and mesenteric fat stranding. And CT with dual energy is ideal for Crohn's patients. Very nice example here. We see the prominent vasorecta going to the patient's right colon and distal small bowel. We can see in this case there's an enterolith present in bowel. And as we follow it down, we can see very nicely a transition point in the small bowel, classic zone of narrowing, partial obstruction developing, an enterolith above that zone, very, very nicely shown in the coronals as well as in the 3D imaging. With Crohn's disease, obstruction is so common, surgeons would like not to have to operate. This case has massive distension, so you know, you really have to worry and you follow it downward and you can see the collapsed right colon and there in the coronal view, you can see the very distal ilium is markedly thickened. This is a very unusual case. I mean, it looks like classic Crohn's disease thickening, and this patient needed surgery because of the obstruction. But at surgery, this ended up being adenocarcinoma arising in the area of Crohn's disease. Remember, with adenocarcinoma, one of the increased incidents are in sprue, 
but one of them is also in Crohn's disease. Sometimes it's an obvious mass. Here, in a case like this, it was really when the surgeons uh, operated, they didn't see any evidence of tumor. It was on path a week later where tumor was found. So again, it can, can be challenging in that regard. Now, in terms of CT enterography and its acceptance, good articles by Elise showing its value in Crohn's and the uh, European Crohn's and Colitis Organization said CT enterography was the key imaging modality, highest accuracy for the detection of intestinal involvement and assessment of inflammatory activity. Another article, Parente, showed that CT enterography had more than an 80% sensitivity and specificity for detecting small bowel segments affected by Crohn's disease. And again, this article talked about the importance of multiplanar reconstruction. So that's a good start. We've spoken a little bit about the basic principles of examination, some of the causes and how we interpret uh, suspected small bowel obstruction. And let's take a five minute break and then come right back and look at some of the other causes of small bowel obstruction. See you in a moment.